Thank you so much. And if you're wondering why you're seeing me in this format, it's because the first few minutes of my keynote address, uh, the audio got cut off. And so I'm recording this beginning part, and then you can see the rest of it uh, as I did it at the conference. So thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to come before you today to talk about one of the most urgent issues facing this country, the risk that we will not continue to have free and fair elections in the United States. In the days after the 2020 presidential election, when it appeared that Joe Biden had beaten Donald Trump to become the 46th president of the United States, Trump embarked on an unprecedented and dangerous multi-pronged attempt to overturn the election results. The United States elects its president using a Byzantine state-by-state -state electoral college system. Each state sets its own rules for conducting the election and certifying the state's winner, subject to some minimal federal laws. And our system is far more decentralized than just elections state by state. We conduct something like 8,000 simultaneous elections for president, mostly on the county level with different rules, different machines, and different procedures across the country. Trump's strategy was to overturn the results in enough states that Biden had won, so that either Trump could be declared the winner outright, or could create a situation where neither he nor Biden would be able to successfully claim a majority of electoral college votes at the point when Congress counted the votes. That would have triggered a contingent election under the 12th Amendment, an election in which the president is chosen by the House of Representatives, under a rule where each state delegation, regardless of size, gets only one vote. Trump would have been favored to win under such a system, given the political configurations of the state delegations back then. Trump targeted different states and different state actors within the states in an attempt to subvert election results. In Georgia, for example, among other things, he tried to get Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger to quote unquote find 11,780 additional votes for him to flip the state from a narrow Biden victory to the narrowest of Trump victories. In states such as Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, all states with Republican legislatures but whose voters chose Biden over Trump, Trump targeted Republican legislative leaders and asked them to accept bogus claims of voter fraud or other irregularities as an excuse to appoint a so-called alternative slate of electors, even though neither state nor federal law allowed the appointing of such electors. Trump also tried to pressure Republican governors in states that Biden had won, such as Arizona's Doug Ducey, to do something to interfere with the appointment of Biden electors. Trump and his allies also tried to litigate in state and federal courts, in some cases all the way to the Supreme Court, raising theories that if successful would have thrown out state electoral college votes or flipped from the Biden column to the Trump column. In one of the most audacious and factually and legally deficient filings, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, a Trump ally, unsuccessfully went directly to the Supreme Court in an original action seeking to have the results of the election thrown out in Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, all Biden states with Republican legislatures that presumably could have stepped in and cast new electoral college votes for Biden. Now, we all know how the story ends. Although Trump had many allies, most Republican officials did the right thing. They didn't find votes for Trump. They didn't declare there was fraud. No state legislature tried to appoint alternative slates of electors. Some rogue electors met, but their votes were not counted. And, and they now face state and federal investigations and even possible criminal charges. In Congress, some Trump allies objected to the vote counts in Arizona and Pennsylvania, even though there was no evidence of significant fraud or irregularities. And every reason to believe that Biden had won albeit narrowly, in both states. Trump's lies spread relentlessly on Twitter and other social media, activated a group of rioters who on January 6, 2021, were able to disrupt Congress's counting of the votes. Some targeted the Vice President, Mike Pence, whom Donald Trump had pressured to throw out enough electoral college votes from Biden to throw the election to the House. Chilling hang Mike Pence chants echoed in the halls of Congress. The events led to violence, injuring over 150 Capitol Police officers, and four of those officers died by suicide within months of the riot. But eventually, police quelled the violent insurrection, Congress reconvened and counted the votes, and declared Biden the winner. Trump left town before Biden's January 20th, 2021 inauguration, becoming a rare outgoing president not to attend the inauguration of his successor. In the year and a half since then, Trump has relentlessly called the 2020 election stolen or rigged, convinced millions of his followers of the false belief that he was the true winner. He supported sham audits, including here in Arizona, that offered no proof of fraud. No bamboo in the ballots from China, as was alleged during the faux Arizona audit, 
or Italian space lasers altering election results as some Trump allies floated in the period after the election. And yes, those were real conspiracy theories backed by no evidence, but that people believed. As recently as this past July, Trump called upon Wisconsin election leaders to decertify the results of the 2020 election, pointing to a state Supreme Court decision holding that the use of ballot drop boxes violates state law. That decision and earlier Wisconsin decisions made clear that the use of drop boxes did not undermine the results of the 2020 election. And there was no evidence whatsoever of drop boxes being used to commit fraud. One may look at the story of the 2020 election as a victory for the federal system of running elections. The hyper decentralization of American elections turned out to be its strength, the argument goes. Federalized elections were a bulwark towards protecting democracy. Donald Trump couldn't manipulate any federal agency to declare him the winner of the election because there was no such federal agency. Even if one state had gone rogue, such as Georgia overturning election results, that wouldn't have affected the entire election outcome because Georgia did not have enough electoral college votes alone to swing the results of the election. Today, I wanna to push back on this argument and take the position that our federalized system for choosing the president, far from being a bulwark, actually increases the risk of election subversion in the future, at least compared to a system that I've advocated since the early 2000s, national independent nonpartisan administration of elections. I wanna make three claims about federalism and US elections and the danger of election subversion in my talk today. First, I argue that federalized decentralized elections raise security and subversion risks because of what I call the weakest link theory of election administration. The dangers here are far greater than under a centralized system for administering elections. Second, I argue that the supposed containment of election risks, what we might call the what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas principle, cannot be counted on as a virtue of a federalized decentralized system. In fact, a national network of people who work together to undermine election integrity now exists. And rather than containment, we have contagion. Third, I argue that a federalized system of election administration is more likely to be political than a national system, and that a strategy of nationalizing elections has the greatest chance of instituting truly nonpartisan, independent election administration. After making these three arguments, I will conclude by talking about the world of the second best. If we're not going to get national nonpartisan election administration, and we are not in the United States, at least for the foreseeable future, how can we move to the closest to this national model? and insulate our elections from the greatest risks of election subversion uh, increased by our federal system. All right, so I'm gonna to turn to my first point, the weakest link. Antrim County, Michigan, Coffee County, Georgia, Mesa County, Colorado. These are not places that many people would have been able to locate on a map even if, uh, or even would have heard of until recently. I certainly had not heard of them before the 2020 election. But what happened in these counties nicely illustrates the weakest link theory of election administration, and this time with a malfeasant twist. Questions on what voting machines to buy, access to that equipment, and personnel to run that equipment are, main, are made mainly at the local level with parameters set by state election officials. There are all kinds of machines and systems used by election officials to run elections. There are tablets or printed lists of those registered voters who are eligible to vote and what races they're eligible to vote in. There are the machines used to record voters' votes, often producing a piece of paper, sometimes with a code, to count those voters' votes. And there are ballot scanners that scan the recorded ballots and tally up the votes. Recently released surveillance video that came to light as part of a lawsuit by people concerned with the security of election machinery in Georgia revealed that in Coffee County, technical experts hired by Trump lawyer and conspiracy theorist Sidney Powell got access to much of this voting machinery, and they were able to copy software information from the machines. Among the people in the room, according to a recent CNN report, was one of the fake Trump electors for Georgia. In response to these latest revelations, Georgia's Secretary of State's office is going to junk some of the equipment and replace it at a cost of hundreds of thousands of dollars. They say they're doing this to promote voter confidence in the election results. Unfortunately, it's not clear that replacing the equipment will do much to mitigate the security risk. The software for the entire state is out there in the wild, and replacing the equipment from which it is stolen does nothing. Marilyn Marks, executive director for the Coalition of Good Governments, an election security uh, organization that has sued 
uh, the state of Georgia, told the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. It's insulting, she said, and it doesn't deal with the extreme rich, risk. The Georgia breach is now the subject of a criminal investigation, part of a broader Fulton County, Georgia investigation into attempts to manipulate the 2020 election results. Similar breaches happened in Antrim County, Michigan, where copied election software information was uh, unsuccessfully used in a lawsuit to try to overturn the 2020 presidential election results from Michigan. Trump and his supporters have made false claims of election hacking repeatedly based on the copied code in Antrim. And in Mesa County, Colorado, a former elections clerk named Tina Peters, who unsuccessfully ran for the Republican nomination for Secretary of State, is now under state felony indictment for illegally allowing access to her county's election machinery. The suspicion is that Peters shared the information with Mike Lindell of My Pillow fame, a person who has relentlessly spread false claims of a stolen 2020 election, and it was called for Donald Trump to be reinstalled as president now and for President Biden to be removed. Peters ran for the Republican nomination uh, for Secretary of State of Colorado, aiming to be Colorado's chief election officer. She didn't win that primary, but other election deniers did win their primaries, and they could well win in next month's elections and be put in charge of running elections in parts of the United States in 2024. I've long written about what I've termed weakest link theory of election administration. The idea is an election system in a highly decentralized system is only as strong as the weakest people working in that system. So in my 2012 book, The Voting Wars, I discuss how in a 2011 state Supreme Court race in Wisconsin, I'll, I'll keep making the Wisconsin references, um, the results of the election flipped when the chief election official in Waukesha County, Wisconsin, Kathy Nicholas, misreported the results in that race. She had kept the results on her personal laptop and realized the day after the election that she had forgotten to include her reported vote totals of 14,315 votes from the town of Brookfield. When those results were added in, they flipped the election from a Democrat winning the Secretary of State's race to a Republican. And in my 2020 book, Election Meltdown, I talk about Brenda Snipes, who in 2018 was running elections in Broward County, Florida. There was a close race between incumbent Bill Nelson and challenger then Governor Rick Scott. This was for the U.S. Senate seat. The race came down to a recount, but Broward couldn't get its recount results submitted to the state in time because someone in her office did not know how to use the website to submit the election results to the state. And that was just the beginning of the problems that came to light. The totals in the recount were considered so untrustworthy that the Broward County Election Board decided to go with their original totals rather than the recounted totals of the votes. In both of my earlier books, I pointed to a computer science maxim known as Hanlon's razor. The idea is don't attribute to malice that which can be explained by incompetence. Nicholas was accused by Democrats of being a Republican hack because she had a Republican background, she, that she was trying to manipulate the results for Republicans. Snipes was a Democrat, and Republicans, including Trump, accused her of manipulating the results to favor Bill Nelson, the Democrat. Trump said, quote, if you look at this person, in this case, a woman involved, she has a horrible history. I mean, if you look at what they've done, you look at the dishonesty, look, look, there are bad things going on in Broward County, really bad things. There was no evidence that either Nicholas nor Snipes were deliberately manipulating election results. They were just in over their heads. But my earlier point about the weakest link theory was that even when all that's going on is incompetence, people are on the other side of the political aisle will suspect election officials are engaging in deliberate malfeasance in highly polarized times. And that can cause distrust among some voters about the entire system, no matter that 99% of election workers and officials are doing the right thing. But what started in 2020 represents a sea change for the worse. Coffee County, Antrim County, Mesa County, these are not election officials who are incompetent. These are election officials engaged in actual malfeasance. And it's not just them. Thousands of poll workers are being recruited today by Steve Bannon and others who have been primed to believe that election fraud is rampant. Poll workers have been trained in Michigan to report, to report purported problems, not up the chain of command to those uh, election officials who are in charge, but instead directly to the state Republican Party. Even if most election workers in most states, in most counties, do the right thing, the system can collapse when the weakest links fail. The leak of voting machine software poses risks everywhere in the country that these machines are being used. 
Messing up voting at polling places in one part of a state can be enough to call an entire state's election results into question in a close race. Again, even if most people are doing the right thing, but in enough pockets they are not, these weakest links can bring down the whole chain. And that, uh, that chain is what keeps our election results accurate and public confidence in the accuracy and fairness of our results solid. Our hyper-decentralized election system, now mixed with malfeasance, creates conditions in which election results can be sabotaged much more easily than under a centralized system with uniform machinery, security, procedures, and rules. All right, second, on to contagion. One of the supposed great virtues of the hyper-decentralized system of election administration in the U.S. is that a problem in one state does not undermine the entire election system, right? The containment idea. Walter Olson, writing at the Cato at Liberty blog in December of 2020, as Trump continued to contest the 2020 election results, argued that decentralization, quote, is a source of deep resilience. Part of this is practical. With dozens of voting systems in use, if a newly introduced machine is overly subject to breakdown, at least it isn't causing havoc everywhere at once. If some states adopt a bad or inefficient practice, they can profit from the examples of states like Florida that have implemented more efficient methods after their own costly experience. Far more important, it prevents a power from being decentralized that would be dangerously tempting to demagogues and authoritarians, he said. We're we are so lucky that elections have never been federalized. No one in Washington can give orders to fire, fire local election board officials. Olson also quoted... Econ uh, economist Steve Landsberg, who wrote in a Wall Street Journal op-ed that, quote, a future presidential election in which the incumbent refuses to concede and enlist the full power of the federal government to overturn the apparent democratic outcome. Now, imagine that the election in question is actually run by a federal agency or some nationwide quasi-governmental authority charged with collecting and aggregating results in all 50 states. I don't know about you, he said, but I might worry a little bit about the pressure that could be brought to bear on that single authority. Recent events, however, demonstrate that election subversion risks are not mitigated. And in fact, today, I believe they're magnified by our hyper-polarized election system. So meet the members of America, America First Secretary of State Coalition, comprised of four Secretary of State candidates, Arizona's Mark Fincham, Michigan's Christina Caramo, Nevada's Jim Marchant, and New Mexico's Audrey Trujillo. According to a September 2022 America, uh, Associated Press report, these four candidates who are elect election deniers claiming falsely that the 2020 election was stolen from Trump, they have their own election subverting platforms. Quote, eliminating voting machines, mailed ballots, and early voting are among their goals, according to the AP. The coalition also supports hand counting of all ballots in a single day of voting, for all Americans, with few exceptions. Many of their ideas are based on unfounded claims that voting machines are being manipulated. So today, the threat of election subversion and election denialism is not confined to one state's borders. Indeed, many people have both a financial and a political incentive to spread false claims of a stolen 2020 election and to put in to office cadres of people who either believe the election was stolen or almost as good are willing to say that they believe that the 2020 election was stolen. Think, for example, of Mike Lindell's conferences around the country perpetuating the lie of a stolen election or the actions of True the Voter, other voter, so-called voter integrity organizations which rally around false or exaggerated claims of fraud. Putting poll workers and poll watchers into place with heavy concentrations of minority voters. These groups, are, in fact, are doing the opposite of promoting election integrity. Some people have gotten very rich off election lies. In addition to personal enrichment, the claims of a stolen election can serve political goals, from delegitimizing a Democratic candidate's victories as the product of fraud and destabilizing the system to more nefarious goals, creating the conditions for actual election subversion that would change election losers into election winners. But the biggest problem is the insider threat. When the people running our elections believe or say they believe the election lies. So let's imagine back in 2020 that Brad Raffensperger, the Secretary of State of Georgia, had less fortitude and a weaker moral compass. Raffensperger declares that because of certain vaguely described irregularities, he could not consider the close vote count in Georgia for president to be an accurate one. He calls upon the Georgia legislature to convene and choose an alternative slate of electors which they do for Trump. 
Such a move, if successful, alone would not have changed a Biden uh, victory into a Trump victory. It would have moved Biden from 306 to 232 to 290 to 248 in the Electoral College. But then the pressure on Republican legislatures in other states would have been enormous to make up that now 42 vote difference. Arizona's 11 uh, plus Pennsylvania's 20 plus Wisconsin's 10 would have made it a one vote margin. Nebraska splits its electoral college votes. So you could just flip one there to kick it to the House of Representatives. If not Nebraska, then maybe Michigan, which also had a Republican uh, legislature whose um, voters voted for Biden. In an era of election denialism and rampant false claims and conspiracy theories about elections, we can no longer count on the state-by-state state or county-by-county county system as a bulwark against contagion. Especially now, as we see infiltration of election denialists as poll workers, it's easy to imagine a future election, uh, that in a future election some ginned-up controversy, perhaps driven by a poll worker who lacks understanding of actual election procedures, believing that that is fraud, takes that claim and it gets seized upon by those, again, with political and financial incentives to try to not just call into doubt the election, but to flip the election itself. Rampant conspiracism that we have today leads to contagion, not containment. Beyond the weakest link problem and the contagion risk is the inherently political nature of state and local election administration in the United States. Decentralization and politicization are a dangerous combination. And here, I think Rebecca and I will have something to talk about later on, because she takes the opposite uh, view. Most states have a chief election officer who is a party official or candidate. Wisconsin, whose bipartisan election administration was held up by University of Wisconsin's dean and my friend and casebook co-author Dan Takaji as the model, America's top model, of election administration in the United States, was dismantled by the Republican state legislature based on a claim that it, well, I, well, I think it's a false claim, uh, that it was too partisan in helping Democrats. It was replaced by a new board. And in 2020, that board was attacked for doing things like, heaven forbid, authorizing the return of absentee ballots by drop boxes in the midst of a once in a century pandemic that made congregating inside especially dangerous. On the state and local level, many election officials are involved in party politics. Almost two decades after liberals excoriated Florida Secretary of State Catherine Harris for serving as chair of George Bush's presidential campaign in Florida in the moments before Bush versus Gore, California's then Secretary of State and current California Senator Alex Padilla endorsed Hillary Clinton over Bernie Sanders in the 2016 presidential primary and regularly endorsed candidates for office and ballot propositions despite being the person who certified the winners in those contests. Now, being political doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to act in bad faith in administering elections. Many partisan election officials, indeed most, take their oaths seriously and do their jobs fairly. But there is an inherent conflict of interest when election officers have their allegiance to political parties uh, and not only to the integrity of the electoral process. And in our current risky moment of election denialism, political forces may be too great to resist. Consider then... Uh, the Michigan State Canvassing Board, a body which essentially serves as a rubber stamp to verify election results in the state and to perform other uh, functions. The board is made up of two Democrats and two Republicans. During the 2020 election, there was pressure on the Republican board members not to certify a Joe Biden win, despite Biden beating Trump by over 150,000 votes. One Republican member of the Michigan board abstained and the other voted to accept Biden's, election, uh, Biden's uh, victory. Biden's electors were submitted by the state of Michigan and ultimately counted by Congress. But that member who accepted the results, Aaron Van Landerveld, that member who had a legal duty to report the election results uh, accurately, he was quickly booted from his position by party members who voted him out of that position. Just this year, two new Republicans on the board, citing a technicality in spacing, uh, uh, word spacing, on initiative petitions blocked the appearance of an abortion rights measure on the 2022 Michigan general election ballot. It took an order of mandamus from the state Supreme Court to the canvassers to restore that measure to the ballot. Positions like county and state canvassing board members are political positions, and they're controlled by state and local party officials and activists. In the current Republican Party, many of these officials and activists believe 
or say they believe that the last election was stolen. These are the party stalwarts who are most likely not to be open uh, to reason about the last election. And they're going to be the ones who are going to insist on litmus tests about who is running for state or local office to be election officials or to serve on county or state boards. There's simply no constituency today within the base of today's Republican Party to push back against the claims of a, of a stolen election. Indeed, almost all of the Republican members of the House who voted in favor of the impeachment of Trump, second impeachment, based on actions connected to attempts to subvert the 2020 election, either have retired or have been defeated in Republican primaries. Radicalization of local Republican Party activists drives, uh, uh, drives into election-related positions those who follow, follow the party line on election denialism. The current political moment exacerbates the dangers. So what do we do about this threat? This triple threat of weak links, contagion, and politicization of state and local election administration. If I could wave my magic wand, I would nationalize elections for president and Congress and use national nonpartisan election administration uh, body to run elections. Among other things, doing so would minimize the risk of election subversion in the United States by transferring power to an independent nonpartisan body, much like the Federal Reserve. As I'll explain in a minute, that's not going to happen anytime soon in the United States. But before turning there, let me talk about how, if there were the political bill will, this would be a completely doable and worthwhile change. How do I know? Because just about every other advanced democracy in the world, including Australia, Canada, and Great Britain, uses a system of national nonpartisan election administration. Those running elections have certain powers that insulate them from political interference, much like the Federal Reserve Board. There are a few examples in the United States of such bodies, but they can be made to work. A truly independent body would not run the risks that Walter Olson or Steve Landsberg alluded to of an incumbent president or presidential challenger being able to use the power of the federal government to pressure election officials to subvert election results. The uniformity of the rules and machinery coupled by top-down security and management will go a long way towards minimizing the risk of sabotage. The idea of letting a thousand flowers bloom works in many contexts, but not where security and, inform and uniformity are virtues and are true bulwarks against manipulation. One question would be about how to select the leader of the independent national agency. I've long proposed that the, uh, the president um, uh, have the power to nominate the head of this national nonpartisan agency, subject to confirmation votes by supermajorities in both houses of Congress. Given current polarization, we might have to think about new mechanisms to get around partisan refusal to approve any candidate. For example, we might allow the election czar to serve after a particular period of time if the opposing party does not put up the nominee for a vote, or create a system where if the opposing party votes down two uh, candidates in a row, then the matter falls to a supermajority of the Supreme Court to appoint a temporary czar. There are ways to get around even our polarization on choosing the, an election czar. If we were having a rational conversation in normal political times, we could in theory talk about the details of selection and the powers of the National Election Administrator and how to best both in, insulate that administrator from political pressure while still assuring that there's enough oversight if the election administrator herself commits acts of malfeasance or incompetence. But that discussion is not worth having today because we're so, so far away from National Election Administration. It's a complete political non-starter. After the 2000 election, Democrats and Republicans came together, passed the Help America Vote Act, in part to replace aging equipment, and among provisions of that act was the creation of a mostly, mostly toothless agency, which probably no one who's not, who's, who's not an election law expert in this room has ever heard of. It's called the United States Election Assistance Commission. How many non-election law people in the room have heard of that? Okay, not, this, for those on Zoom, there's not a hand that went up, not one. Two Democratic commissioners, two Republican commissioners, has very little power other than certifying election machinery as uh, trustworthy and giving out grants uh, for replacing voting equipment and coming up with best practices. Despite its toothlessness, Republicans in the House for years have tried to shut it down, and they're not alone. The National Association of Secretaries of State, made up of Republicans and Democrats, has consistently opposed the existence of the EAC, claiming it's an infringement on their rights to administer elections. So even today, if we were starting the United States anew, we might well follow other countries in setting up national nonpartisan election administration. Even if we were starting again, the entrenched interests and our history 
along with Republican opposition ideologically to more federal power to administer elections, dooms any proposal in the short term for such a change. That means we need to move to second best solutions. Solutions that don't get us to national nonpartisan election administration, but minimize those risks of weak links, contagion, and politicization. So what does that look like? First, on weak links. One of the things that HAVA did was centralize state voter registration databases. Sounds about the unsexiest thing possible, rather than leaving the issue on the local level. But experience has shown that this was a great success. Shifting power from, to states, from localities, improved the process of election administration. Our election rolls are cleaner than they were before, and now states cooperate with each other through an organization called ERIC, and they remove duplicate uh, voter registrations across states. So if we can't nationalize, we can at least stateize. State power over local power. Centralization within states can help. Having all counties use the same voting machines, for example, can provide state, state standards about who can access those machines and can make the insider threat harder to do. But of course, not impossible if the insider threat is the Secretary of State. I told you I would mention Arizona. <laughs> Along with centralization of election machinery and processes, we need improved transparency. One of the reasons that Brenda Snipes' incompetence in running Broward County, Florida's elections came to light was that Florida had good rules for promoting transparency, public access to the vote tabulation process. The more sunshine, uh, the less discretion in the hands of local election officials, the better. And because it's often hard to tell incompetence from malfeasance, better funding for election administration on the state and local level is essential. During the 2020 election, in the middle of the pandemic, Election advocates beg Congress to provide more funding uh, for local election administration, given the seriously increased cost of running a safe and fair election during COVID. Congress, of course, did not step up and provide the money. Who did? Mark Zuckerberg. The Mark Zuckerberg and Patricia Chan initiative came up with hundreds of millions of dollars in charity to help the 2020 elections run so smoothly. And because no good deed goes unpunished, Republicans attack now this funding as so-called Zuckerbucks. Now you can see um, Representative Boebert, I don't know if you can see it on there, and the Zuckerbucks, making false claims that the money was directed and intended only to help Democratic areas weather the COVID election. Some Republican states have since banned private donations to help elections run fairly, a defensible position only if the government's going to provide adequate funding for elections, which is my first choice too. Without adequate funding, the risk of poor elections, the accompanying growth of conspiracy theories will be ever present. Second on contagion. This is a much harder problem to combat. And the contagion problem flows from changes in our information environment, and particularly the rise of election disinformation spread across social media, cable news, and elsewhere. It's much easier today than it was in the past to spread false claims of stolen elections and to undermine election integrity. In my book, Cheap Speech, I offer a number of proposals to try to give voters the tools to reject election-related disinformation. Some of these tools are legal changes, such as a law that bans lying about when, where, and how people vote. These laws have to be carefully crafted, given the real First Amendment concerns and a commitment to both fair elections and free speech. Other proposals are not about legal change, but instead about social change, such as finding ways to bolster the power of trusted intermediaries, like the local press, to give voters the tools they need to figure out who is telling them the truth. Another proposal would elevate the role of election administrators so that voters can know who is providing them with official information. This is a large topic for another day. It's naughty with no quick or easy solution. Finally, on politicization. To the extent possible, we need change to remove conflicts of interest. Election officials should not be able to endorse candidates while serving uh, on, uh, at the same time on political parties committee, committees. Discretion should be taken away from political actors, like canvassing boards, that don't do anything to check the actual accuracy of the votes. And there should be an easier path for voters to go to federal and state court to ensure that election results actually reflect the will of the voters. There is, with all of these second best solutions, what my friend and Yale uh, Law Dean Heather Gerken calls the here to there problem. It's far easier to conjure up solutions to election problems than to figure out the path for getting reform done. So in the end, the problem we face is that we have some actors not acting in good faith in describing our election system and the risk of manipulation. These lies about elections 
increase the risk of actual manipulation. It's a paradigmatically Orwellian problem that some of the people yelling the loudest about election integrity are the ones most undermining it. Ultimately, it may take a social movement to save our democracy. The 2020 election season showed that our problems go much deeper than one person, and we can no longer take the existence of free and fair elections for granted. Change won't be easy, but I'm confident that a big part of the problem lays in our federalized, hyper-decentralized, politicized election system. Our immediate task must be to ameliorate some of the greatest dangers of that system, given that we can't eliminate the system entirely. We can, we must do better. Our democracy in 2024 and beyond depends on it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rick. It's extremely thought-provoking and really appreciate your commentary. And I know we're going to have some pushback from the audience about centralization, I, I suspect, especially on the comparative angle, having to spend some time in Mexico and know a little bit about the kinds of political pressures that can be brought to bear on a centralized electoral authority, as you well know, uh, by a president who's, who is very focused on doing so. So um, I want to ask sort of a Perhaps because I'm a law professor, I love living in the worlds of hypotheticals. I'm a social scientist, so I like to think about counterfactuals. Um, the one counterfactual I've been fascinated by, and since you started with a discussion of January 6th, I hope you don't mind my asking you a counterfactual about that day. Um, and that is, what would have happened or could have happened, and in your opinion, based upon your obviously careful study of the event, what could have happened if, if the Secret Service had not kept the president from going to Capitol Hill? And what do you think would have unfolded at that time? I, 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 think, I think we do need to think about that. Perhaps it's, you know, again, in the world of counterfactuals, but we came very close to this happening, and it certainly could happen again. So I wondered if you might just start with that counterfactual, and then I want to turn to the issues that you raise, and then we'll open it to the audience as well. I think there's a, probably, I don't know, Carol, is there a, a roving? Perfect. Okay, great. Good, good. Okay. Um, so I don't have a good sense of what would have happened other than that there would have been violence still. And the president's not going anywhere without a Secret Service contingent. And uh, with a lack of coordination between the Secret Service and the local police and, you know, Trump trying to charge into the building, if that's what ends up happening, it, there might, he might have made an easier path. And then it might have been easier to assassinate political leaders. I mean, I... I wrote uh, at the beginning of Sheep Speech that, you know, I think we came extremely close to a full-blown constitutional and political crisis. If you imagine the terrible scenario where, you know, um, Vice President Pence is assassinated or Nancy Pelosi is assassinated, Trump declares martial law, Congress does not convene, they close the Capitol, Congress doesn't convene to count the Electoral College votes, and Trump tries to um, take extraordinary powers, martial law, whatever he's going to call it. And what happens after that, I think it's impossible to know. But I think we were extremely lucky. I don't think of January 6th as a lucky day, but we're extremely lucky that it was not much worse than it was uh, in terms of the violence, because just a little more violence could have upended our, our order. And I mean, I think that shows how fragile our system is that we could say that. You know, I think back to when um, George W. Bush handed power to Barack Obama, 2008. Conservative Republican, liberal Democrat. Nobody asked, would Bush leave office? You know, would Bush come to the, to the um, uh, inauguration? You know, it was this celebration. I'd written a blog post that day saying we shouldn't take a peaceful transition of power for granted. But of course, everybody did. Um, and now we can't. Um, and I, I think January, I, when I wrote my most recent book, Cheap Speech, I had a draft done before January 6th. It was done in November and December, predicting that we were moving towards violence. And I had to rewrite the book because the violence had come. I mean, people who study comparative politics and see declines of democracy around the world see that the United States is in a precarious position. Yes, and I, I, I think uh, most recent Bulwark podcast, actually, I was listening to, focuses on the civil war that people discuss now 
very, very actively on Twitter. And so I think we do, and, and on other social media platforms. Well, um, let me turn then to the, the issue of contagion that you mentioned, which I think uh, one of the things that you posted on Twitter just uh, I think this morning or, or yesterday um, was a story about Gwinnett uh, County in, in Georgia where they're being inundated by challenges to voter registration rolls. And that strikes me as sort of part of perhaps a larger coordinated effort to take advantage of state laws that allow for these kind of challenges to be made. And do you see that sort of as a, as a, a sort of a piece of a, a much larger trend toward um, perhaps take or leveraging existing state laws and other local laws to undermine perceptions of integrity in the election process? Sure. Now, you know, there have been attempts to challenge voters for a long time. Lots of those attempts to challenge voters didn't materialize. Some, some older uh, election law scholars may remember in 2004, there was a claim that um, there would be 35,000 uh, challengers in Ohio polling places, and this was going to disrupt the polls. And Justice Stevens issued, refused to issue an order in the middle of the night before Election Day. And then, and so they could go forward, and then the challengers didn't show up. Hmm. Um, but I think things are different now, in part because of social media. Uh, people are not just hyped up, but they're able to organize. It's very inexpensive to find people around the country who believe what you believe. And it's not just about election challenges, what, cha you know, challenging voters. One of the things we're seeing around the country, and we've had a number of stories on Election Law Blog about this as well, is the FOIAing of um, election offices, requesting papers, requesting uh, checks of documents. One of, there's a federal law that says that uh, ballot materials from a federal election need to be kept for 22 months. And so we're not that far off from throwing out the 2020 stuff, or at least able mm -hmm. to. And now there are all these attempts to get those done. Election officials who are in their busy season running elections are responding to all these things. And it is definitely a coordinated effort. It's happening around the country. So there are ways to disrupt uh, Steve Bannon. His goal is 85,000 poll workers across the United States who subscribe to the claim that the last election was stolen, who are gonna be on the lookout and many of them are going to places with heavy concentrations of minority voters. Uh, I think there's a lot of ways of gumming up the works. And to get back to the theme of the conference and my talk, part of the reason this is happening is because of this decentralized nature of the system and the fact that there are different rules in different places and different vulnerabilities in different places to go after. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, other bulwarks. Um, so your argument, of course, is that federalism is no bulwark. Um, we're, we're hosting a conversation here at the center in November about whether courts can be bulwarks for democracy. And I, one thing I'd love to hear you comment on and reflect upon is, you know, what do you think about how the judiciary performed in 2020? And is the judiciary poised um, to provide sort of a, uh, that kind of bulwark? Seems to me that, you know, all the news we heard about all the 62 or out of 63 cases that, that went against Donald Trump hadn't, did not make a dent in the election denier um, uh, narrative. So I'd, I'd like to hear what you think about that. So first on the dents in the election denier narrative, I think that's a somewhat separate point whether, from whether the courts did a good job and helped Agreed. us. Agreed. So on the question of what truth would matter to say the 20 or 30 percent of the country that believes the claims of the stolen election, I don't think there's any truth that would make a difference. So when I wrote uh, Election Meltdown, Looking ahead to the 2020 elections, I said, you know, the one thing that will save us is if we have a really clean, competent election. And then COVID hit, and I thought, this is going to be hard. And I think we had one of the best run elections nationally, in part because everybody was watching and, you know, there was a lot of attention paid to doing things right. But that didn't matter at all. Donald Trump still made his claims, which were echoed. Um, one of the slides I had there, I don't think I gave the statistic when I spoke, Trump was able to go to social media between November 3rd and November 23rd, 400 times to make false claims about the election being stolen. And each one of these is amplified millions of times, right? Or reaches millions of followers and then gets amplified. Um, truth doesn't matter in that context. So for that group of people, I don't think any, uh, you know, the court's saying this, I don't think any of that matters. You know, there's a great report that, um, Senator Danforth, Ben Ginsburg, a bunch of other conservative mm -hmm. luminaries put out called Lost Not Stolen that debunks all of the claims. It's out there, it's definitive, and it's not making a dent among that cohort. I think 
thinking about election subversion more generally, we have to be thinking about the center and how do we preserve um, confidence in a fair process in the center. And I should say that when elections in Iowa start taking office, if your Secretary of State in 2024 in Arizona is going to be an election denier, and let's say he runs the election totally fairly and does everything right, and let's say it's Trump versus Biden too and Trump wins, you think Democrats are going to believe that? No way. And there's going to be a new mm -hmm. crisis of lack of confidence on the Democratic side. It's, it's going to yes. mirror this. But now, now back to, so, so, you know, we've got a communication problem that's not tied to the fact. Now, the courts did serve as a bulwark, much like Brad Raffensperger or the, legislative, the Republican legislative leaders in Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania who refused to, and Arizona who refused to, uh, Rusty Bowers, people who refused to go along. A lot of those people will be gone. Um, the courts performed well in rejecting these claims. I don't think they were very good on voting rights before COVID. I had a lot of criticism of, for example, how the Supreme Court handled cases. But when it came to, you come to court with nothing but a fake claim of, uh, of a stolen election, you're not getting anywhere. What I'm concerned about is that, and this is a tangential topic, but that if the Supreme Court in the Moore versus Harper case, which is being argued this term, comes up with any credence to this independent state legislature theory, it could provide a kind of political hook for doing things to try to manipulate election results. So for example, even if the court doesn't say, because I don't think federal law would allow it, that you could pick an alternative slate of electors, and Congress might even pass a law, which I'm hoping they will, saying you can't do that, a state legislature could say, we're gonna do it anyway, Kevin McCarthy could be Speaker of the House and say, we're accepting them anyway, and this, then the courts could decide we're staying out. It's a political mm -hmm. question. I don't know that the courts will serve as the bulwark. And, um, you know, we've had four more years of this wearing down of the social fabric. And so, you know, how courts act pragmatically, it, it's very hard to say. I, I, I was very pleased with the performance of the courts, but I don't know that that continues. Interesting. Well, there may be some questions. I, I have more, but questions from the audience. Uh, hi there, Kevin. It doesn't do anything, so it's just terrific. <laughs> hi there, Kevin Kosar, American Enterprise Institute. Uh, great, great presentation. Love reading your stuff. Um, the other day, I heard an idea, and it was a small idea, but it struck me as an interesting one. And I wonder if you've heard this before: the idea of treating poll watching as akin to jury duty. Namely, people would be drawn by lot and called to perform as poll watchers. And the idea being, number one, you take away the ability of the parties to game this and weaponize this. But number two, you also take individuals and you put them in a situation where they learn election administration firsthand and are probably going to come away a lot less susceptible to the sort of fantasies that get spread on social media. Small incremental change, but I'm just curious what you thought about that sort of thing. I guess I'm a glass half empty person. <laughs> and I would worry that people who are not trained, who would be brought in and would see things they wouldn't understand exactly what was happening, would like buy into, and left or right, would buy into conspiracy theories and think that elections are being manipulated. If it came with a lot of education about how the election works, then I think that would be great. But you know, I know how many people try and get out of jury duty. Um, I don't know how many people would, would do this. Um, I do think, and uh, Rebecca Green uh, has written about the importance of bipartisan poll watching. And I think what's really important is that there are representatives from Democrats, Republicans, and from other minor parties if they want, outside groups, that the process is transparent enough and that there are people on both sides who can be there to vouch for the system. And so, you know, uh, uh, I think it was Ronald McDaniel today was complaining that there are more Democratic poll workers than Republican poll workers. Let her get more Republican poll workers. More the merrier. I think it's great. People should work at polls. Um, but they've got to, like, follow the chain of command. You can't have the Michigan Republican Party telling them, don't report a problem to your supervisor, <coughs> report it to the parties, because that's just a recipe for uh, disaster at the polls. I worry about poorly trained people being put in that environment. It doesn't work. I think you still need it, though, but it helps. helps okay. Yeah. Uh, Larry Garber from uh, Washington. Um, first, just a comment. I mean, I think we, we do need to distinguish between poll watchers and poll administrators. 
and I, I'm not sure which one you were referring to, but I think the argument for drawing a lot might be more applicable you know, to poll administrators and then training them and doing all the things that they would need, uh, while I think transparency requires that the poll watchers be designated uh, by the respective political actors or, or they'll always have uh, distrust. I, I was intrigued, Rick, by your comments about the Federal Reserve Board, which, is, which sounded great and, and you know, does model itself after some of the election commissions uh, overseas. Uh, but the Federal Reserve Board you know, works in a sense because it's this incredibly elite you know, organization, highly technocratic, um, you know, and, and has worked. Whereas, as you said in your presentation, I mean, the elections require a staff of you know, 50,000, 100,000 people that you would be, in a sense, nationalizing um, you know, to, to conduct elections. So question one is just, you know, even in your 30-year you know, horizon, do you think that's possible to cre create that type of national uh, body that would be responsible for administering elections? And how would you deal with the federalism issue that is, you know, underlines this uh, conference, which is that not all states are running the same types of elections. Um, you know, so some states you know, have excessive uh, you know, um, uh, referendums and you know, uh, things like that. Some states you know, elect certain officials that other states don't elect. Uh, and, and then the third question is just on the, the courts. And uh, again, the courts have become also quite you know, polarized, or at least you know, people are viewing them as quite polarized at the federal level, but also at the state level. And, and again, just, you know, any comments on, you know, what we need to do in terms of, um, you know, addressing that problem of both people's confidence in the courts and the fact that they're being perceived as, you know, partisan actors as opposed to neutral. Those are three great questions. Let me see if I can remember all of them. I'll start with the middle one, because that's the one that most of my mind. Uh, uh, no, I'll, I'll, let me, I'll start with, I'll start with, uh, with the, how, how would we get there? And um, it, we built the TSA. I'm not saying we should have built the TSA, but that, that is, there's, you know, thousands of people, new federal agency. We built other federal agencies. Some have proposed using postal workers as election workers. Uh, there are ways that it can happen, and we know that other countries are able to run their elections um, nationally. Now, maybe this feeds into the second question. We could just have this system where all you're electing on the National Election Day is the President, Senator, and Congress. That would make it a lot easier, make vote counting go a lot faster. Um, and then, you know, that, that's one possible way to do it. Um, but I've been reading a lot of uh, Fernita Tolson's work on the power of Congress. And I'm, I'm really convinced that we've all gotten it wrong that the Constitution in the Elections Clause, so Article 1, Section 4, that lets Congress alter any state rules related to federal elections, as well as the enforcement powers in the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, the 19th Amendment, the 24th Amendment, and the 26th Amendment, put them all together, Congress has a lot of power to essentially do a full takeover of federal elections. I don't think there's a constitutional limitation to that. It's a political pr problem. That's why I don't think it's going to happen. Um, Ted Cruz, the sole senator on the uh, Senate Rules Committee that was looking at this bill that would try to fix the Electoral Count Act, he was the sole dissenter in the committee, it was 14 to 1. He said this bill federalizes elections. And it does no such thing. But you, you listen to his talking points and then he starts talking about the For the People Act and the, and the uh, Freedom to Vote Act, things that you could argue actually do nationalize elections in some way. But the rhetoric is, so I don't think, I think we could do it uh, legally, but not politically. And then, in terms of the courts, was it that Churchill said about democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others? It's like, why does this new Electoral Count Act bill say, if the governor of the state goes rogue and, and sends in a fake certificate, that you go to federal court? Because, uh, you know, what actor do you have a better shot of being fair with, even if they're not perfect? And I would hope that, um, judges would show the courage as they showed before. That's a lot easier to do when you don't have contested facts. So you think back, now we're more than 20 years past Bush versus Gore, and it's very easy to see why 
Republicans viewed the facts through one lens and Democrats through the other. In 2020, there really were no facts on the Trump side about election irregularity. There, there was nothing there. So there was, but you know, if it's really contested and it's really close and there are arguments on both sides, then I do think the justices are likely to, and the judges are likely to fall into their, not consciously, but to fall into their patterns. But courts are better. I'd rather have courts decide if, you know, Doug Mastriano sends in a, a certificate for someone who's not who the people of Pennsylvania voted for. I'd rather federal courts decide that than Kevin McCarthy. So, you know, are, are there le you know, less political actors than the courts that we could rely on? You know, it's hard to know who those would be. We just for the I Zoom. Yeah. So like, like, uh, like everyone else began by saying that was a terrific, absolutely terrific presentation. Chilling but terrific, or terrific <laughs> but chilling. I'm not sure which way I should do the sequence. And I think I also have, like everyone else, a three-part uh, comment slash question. Uh, so one on the- It wouldn't uh, be a conference. Right, right exactly. <laughs> um, uh, and although it won't be exactly the same as everybody else's, so that would be too much like a faculty meeting. Um, <laughs> but um, so on the first one in terms of the, some cons any kind of national body, Actually, don't doubt the federalism problem. I don't doubt the federalism, that federalism would not be a problem or it could be overcome. I'm actually more concerned about the unitary executive um, and what a body would look like. Is it, given where the Supreme Court's been going on that, on its doubtfulness about uh, the limits on the president's power to remove? So I'm a little curious, and or mm -hmm. you mentioned the Election Assistance Commission. There's also, of course, the Federal Elections Commission. So I would be concerned with they would either have a multi member body which would deadlock as either the EAC or the FEC, or wouldn't get filled, and where you have uh, commissioners who are hanging on 20 years uh, past their, their expiration date, or their term's expiration, they haven't expired. Or <laughs> if you try to have a powerful administrator like an elections candidate, it might not be possible. I'm, I haven't thought about it very much myself, but it, I would ask you to think about it as you go forward. I don't know if you have an answer now, I don't, I'm just a, as you continue to work on this, as to whether or not you could have a single administrator uh, under uh, uh, emergingly dominant Supreme Court theory about the executive, uh, um, uh, a, a, a federal administrator who would be truly independent of the president. I'm, given where the Supreme Court's going, I, I'm skeptical, but I haven't given enough thought to it. Um, the second thought, of course, and is at the statization. Unfortunately, what we're currently seeing, of course, is statization, politicization, with, of course, power being moved from what there is of, of uh, bipartisan or semi-independent um, uh, uh, canvassing boards and others into the state legislature, as just happened in Georgia, uh, and is being proposed elsewhere. So, um, uh, the, I, I agree with you that more state would be have many benefits, but um, I think in, in, in using the Heather Gurk and getting from here to there, we're, we're not going there. Uh, at least the, the current direction is not there. And the final one does connect with uh, uh, the, the discussion before, which of the the unfortunate uh, merging of poll workers and poll watchers, who were two wildly different sets of people. And this does, maybe the one thing that will be a criticism on you is when talking about greater transparency, I think what we're seeing now is the weaponization of poll watchers uh, and the passage of laws in places like Texas and elsewhere, which are designed to make, uh, in, the, in the name of transparency, giving poll watchers who need not be appointed by their parties the ability to basically uh, stall or freeze the entire process by the insistent demands, I want to see this, I want to see that, I want to watch this, I want to watch that, coupled with uh, SB8 equivalents of giving, in effect, vigilante rights uh, to poll watchers being able to sue uh, local election administrators for not allowing them to watch every single step of the way. So although I, transparent, this is one of those situations where I think transparency, in theory, uh, keeps everybody honest and also builds trust, uh, we are in, in danger of transparency and being used as yet another weapon to uh, undermine uh, and really just uh, um, well undermine, I think, the ability of the election uh, system to function. Well, you're really bumming me out, Richard. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm more pessimistic than you are, yeah. so uh, <laughs> that's not unusual yeah. either. So let me, uh, let me start with the third point, just say, again, third time, Rebecca Green yeah. has written the article on too much transparency, and it has to be the right amount of transparency. But there are lots of places where there's not even a basic level of transparency. But yes, the rules have to be balanced. And you know, one of the things I called for, I have a piece on election subversion, the Harvard Law Review Forum, and say one of the big things that Congress hasn't done is provide more protection for election workers mm -hmm. and election officials who are under threat. <coughs> We're talking about attrition rates of 25% in some places of election workers, really dangerous. So I, I agree with you on that. 
On the UCHAR executive point, I have an easy answer to that. I don't think we can have national nonpartisan election administration in the United States without a constitutional amendment. Okay. And it would create essentially an I, independent I branch. Agree, I agree with you on that. Now, how to do that, I would say, uh, yeah, certainly, I certainly would think it would be worse to have an election administrator that's under the uh, power of the president, or that would be worse, no doubt, than, uh, so it has to be non, uh, independent. I, I remember 2004, I took a um, family vacation slash fact-finding trip to Australia and met with the head uh, administrator of the Australian Election Commission. And they have a three-person board. One of them is the, is the government statistician. You know, it's uh, you know, a complete civil servant. Uh, yeah, and uh, one, one is uh, appointed by the parliament. So they have a, uh, they have a, a, th a three-person board. I don't think you can have a bipartisan board because of the deadlock that we've seen at the FEC and somewhat at the EAC. Um, in Canada, they had an election czar, the guy I uh, um, studied named Jean-Pierre Kingsley. He had his own budget. He had a private plane that he could, government plane, but like a charter plane that he could go wherever he needed to to deal with election, put out election fires. So like Ned Foley running American elections is my dream, <laughs> but I, you know, I just don't, I don't know if it's going to happen. And then on your, I, I think it's a really fair criticism of my statization point. Statization only works if it's being done for forces of good, like centralizing of databases as opposed to let's take away the power of local democratic election boards and put it in the hands of the Republican legislature. And in fact, one of the biggest changes I think we're going to see, either in Arizona or somewhere else, is uh, a law that's going to say voters can vote, but the ultimate judge of how those votes went is not going to be done by the state courts, it's going to be done by the state legislature. And that is a scary proposition. Time for one more question. Carol, how are we doing on time? So, so one, more, one more question. Are we, are we can we, I, I can, is that okay with you? Uh, uh, you can cut me off. Three-part question with a comment. That's it. Right. <laughs> my, my question is more of a, it's a comment, more of a question. Um, so I wonder if you could comment on the good aspects, what I view as the good aspects of local election administration, which is places can try out innovative election rules, um, uh, you know, structural issues. You know, the women's suffrage movement, as you know, started initially at the local level uh, with school board elections, local elections. You've got ranked choice voting now started at the local level before moving statewide. And so I worry a little bit that your solution would cut off uh, experiments in trying to make our elections better, uh, you know, and, and improve access uh, to more people. So you're saying voting is for us? Something like that. Yes. Um, I, I think it's a great point. point. There's, I'm only talking about federal elections. There's, there's still going to be local elections. elections. We're not going to elect everybody, you know, on in presidential election years. So you want to have experimentation with, um, uh, and you know, I don't think anything would stop a state, like when I'm talking about national non election administration, if a state wants to use rank choice voting to choose its um, uh, you know, senator, that's fine. You can still do that. And you know, there could be different options that the that the gov that the national government would be able to offer to states. But like in terms of who gets the franchise, that's still a state question, right? So do felons get a main franchise? That's still a state question. So there's still room, and plus in fully state and local elections, so the federal government have nothing to do with it, other than provide protections like the voting rights. Act. Well, I think we are ready for a break. Rick, thank you so much.